Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is proximate versus underlying causes. And the big question for this lecture is what types of causal relationships do we want to identify in this course? Broadly speaking, we can think about causation in one of two ways. The first way is by thinking about proximate causation. A proximate cause asks the question, why did this happen in the way it happened? This is the type of question that you'll see in historical research. And this is concerned about the details of the situation, the proper nouns of what happened. Who was involved? What day did it happen? Where did it occur? And that sort of thing. The other type of explanation we can focus on is underlying causes. Underlying causes ask the question of why was this particular thing asking to happen? This is the focus of political science research, and it's concerned about the abstract details of the case. When I use the word abstract here, I don't mean that in the sense of these things are necessarily difficult to comprehend. Sometimes they will be, other times they won't be. Instead, I want to think about things as what's going on underneath the surface, focusing less on the who was doing these things, when they were doing them, and where they were doing them, and look to see what might be in this particular case that would reappear in other cases beyond just this specific circumstance. And with that in mind, it's a little bit clearer why we're going to be valuing underlying causes more in this course than proximate causes. Proximate causes give us silly policy recommendations that may or may not generalize beyond the specific case. And in contrast, underlying causes tell us how to address what caused this specific case and will also give us leverage on other cases some of which may not be inherently obviously similar to the one that we're analyzing. If we can focus on underlying causes, we may be able to compare two otherwise dissimilar cases and be able to see a commonality between them and understand that it's the same causal process that caused both of those outcomes. Let's go through a few examples of proximate and underlying causes so you can see what I mean. And we'll begin with a dead driver. The proximate cause of Jimmy's death is that he flew through the front windshield of his vehicle. The underlying cause of Jimmy's death is that he was not wearing a seatbelt. Both of these are causal relationships. If Jimmy had not flown through the windshield of his vehicle and smashed his face against the pavement, he would not have died. That's causal. But it's also true that had Jimmy been wearing his seatbelt, he would not have flown through the front windshield of his vehicle, and he would not have died. Both of these are causal. The difference between proximate and underlying causes, though, is that if we try to generalize what we're learning from each of these cases, we're not going to get as far with the proximate causes as we would with the underlying causes. So if you focus on that proximate cause and ask yourself, what have we learned here? Well, it's that you shouldn't fly through the windshield of your vehicle, and perhaps maybe moving back a step, you shouldn't get into car accidents that might cause you to fly through the front windshield of your vehicle. These are both true statements. That's good advice, but it's not particularly insightful. If you focus on the underlying cause, however, we start getting somewhere a little bit better. Wear your seatbelt, and you won't get involved in those accidents where you're flying through the front windshield of your vehicle. You may still get involved in accidents that may be still unavoidable, but at least if you do, you won't be dying afterward. Let's turn to another example, this time going to a global pandemic. The proximate cause of the student's death is COVID-19. The underlying cause is that the student never wore a mask, went to parties all the time, completely ignored social distancing guidelines, and to top it all off, there were no hospital beds when that student got sick. Again, both of these are causal relationships. 
But if we think about what we are learning in each of these cases, we're getting a very different picture. If we look at the proximate cause, the lesson that we're learning here is that we should not catch COVID-19. Fair enough, but also not particularly helpful. Instead, if we look at the underlying cause, what we're learning here is that we should wear masks, we should not go to parties, we should socially distance, and the government should maybe look into expanding hospital resources so that we don't run out of hospital beds and that anyone who needs a hospital bed because of COVID can get one. Now let's take those lessons and apply them a little bit to international relations. The proximate cause of World War I was the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. If you don't know who that is, well, this is Archduke Franz Ferdinand right there. He was geopolitically important because he was the heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian throne. And you can draw a direct causal relationship between his assassination and the outbreak of World War I. This is very clearly the first domino that falls in the outbreak of World War I. However, an underlying cause of World War I is that military technology, at least in the minds of policymakers, gave states a huge first strike advantage at that time. If we look at these two causes, the proximate cause and the underlying cause, we get very different policy prescriptions. For the proximate cause, what we're learning here is that we should not let men with funny mustaches be assassinated especially if they're going to be the heir apparent to a throne. If we look at the underlying cause, what we're learning here, perhaps, is that first strike advantages cause war. We'll talk a lot more about this, both the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and how that was the first domino to fall, but also the underlying cause, the first strike advantages, and how those may in fact cause war as an underlying cause of war, and what could be done to mitigate those sorts of problems. Let's do another one, this time World War II. The proximate cause of World War II is that Hitler was a bad person and did all sorts of evil things in Europe. An underlying cause of World War II is that reparations from World War I bankrupted Germany, thereby allowing domestic institutions to fail. The economy of Germany was an absolute mess following World War I. There was hyperinflation that led to all sorts of weird behaviors. For example, this is someone trying to deposit money. Those bricks are paper bills that are essentially worthless. This is not all that much money after all. The money became so devalued that people started looking for other things to do with it. One of the things that they would do is use it as wallpaper. Others would take big stacks of money like what you saw on the last screen and light them on fire to heat their homes. Inflation got to be so bad that Germany actually printed 50 trillion mark notes. If we focus on the proximate cause, though, what we're learning here is that we should let all aspiring Austrian artists into art school, and so we won't end up with people like Hitler in power, and we won't have to worry about those sorts of things. In contrast, if we focus on the underlying cause, we think about how allowing the domestic institutions of Germany to fail, thereby giving the opportunity for someone like Hitler to rise to power, the lesson that we're learning here is that we should be magnanimous in victory. In fact, this concern was part of the impetus behind the Marshall Plan. After World War II, rather than try to extract every single last piece of value out of Germany, the United States actually extended great international aid to West Germany to try to rebuild the country. To wrap up here, if we focus on proximate causes to derive our policy implications, we're going to end up with some funny things. To be clear, understanding proximate causes is still useful. If you want to know the exact narrative for why something happened, that is a historical question which will require understanding proximate causes. But if we want to extend beyond that particular case, we're going to run into trouble if we're just focusing on those proximate causes. Instead, if we look at underlying causes, we're going to be able to connect otherwise dissimilar situations and make sensible recommendations about today's world. We can use what's happened in the past. We can look into history 
abstract from cases throughout history and see what they have in common with what's going on today or what might be going on five to 10 years from now and be able to make sensible policy recommendations based off of those abstractions. Unfortunately, getting at those underlying causes may not always be easy. We'll talk about why that's the case in the next lecture when we focus on strategic interactions between states. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.